Thank you for coming back after lunch. To, to, we, we, whenever we set these up, the mixed panels do editing, mixing, technology. It's sort of a, a, a platform that we established back when I was doing the Tech Awards, where we have technical excellence and creativity. That's what the Tech Awards stand for. And that, uh, that has been in my, in my head and has sort of formed my thoughts on audio since 1988 when I joined mix and i've always been impressed by the left brain right brain interaction and it, it nowhere sort of does that manifest itself more than in the, in the mix stage to me i mean certainly we have composers everybody's creative don't get me wrong but when it all comes together it's people who have undergone tremendous amounts of technology technological changes over the past 15 20 years right um, and, and yet they're receiving material that they're instantly becoming you know taking it to another level and that's what's always impressed me about being on the re-recording stage. This is something they're delivered blind. They have conversations, certainly with the supervisors and designers. They're hearing something and they're putting their own sort of approach. As we said in there earlier, you give the same tracks to Matt, to Tim, to Tony, and to Greg, and you're gonna have a different you're gonna have a different show, in a sense. Uh, so today, in picking the topic, I wanted to. Uh, I always struggle. What are, what are we going to talk about? What's new? Well, ten years ago. Uh, we uh, Dolby introduced Dolby Atmos in a, in a presentation in the, uh, San Francisco, uh, Petrero. And I remember Yo and Alan being there. They invited the tech journalists. And it was my first introduction. You know, I'd, I'd heard the 6.1 and everything when, when, when they got the mm-hmm. speaker yeah. behind you. The, they center, were, the center back speaker. Yeah, the center back. And they were hoping for the voice of God. But at that time, um, there was, I found out there were very technical problems. The theater, theater ex- exhibitors we're not allowed to put anything in the ceiling for insurance reasons. And this is one of the things that now that's why there are standards about how you mount to the ceiling. They certainly don't want to have a matinee and drop a speaker on somebody's head. Well, we got past that. At that, at that presentation, um, Randy Tom got up and they showed the first reel of the Incredibles. And there was a lot of zooms and buys. And people are flying over your head and there's uh, vehicle buys, bullet buys. And, um, uh, Randy got up there to talk about it after, and he said, you're going to hear a lot of, over the next year, you'll be hearing a lot of swooshes and boobs and effects back here and something going over your head. It was, but really, what I learned in putting this together the first time was that rain coming through the leaves in a forest and doing it is the genius of immersive, in a sense, that we can place objects, we can do all the type of stuff, and that's character, but it, it, creating that environment is the first step. And this is the job, really, of the supervised sound editor on to the mix engineer, creating that environment. So this year, we wanted to say, in 2012, was introduced our first mix event was 2014 under the tagline Immersive Sound. And so I wanted to ask these mix engineers, we've got 10 years under our belt. Uh, we've got the rise of streaming services and television, adopting feature film workflows, feature film impact. Uh, Matthew Waters on the end does Game of Thrones and he thinks of it like he's in the Cary Grant Theater going to a, a, out to a movie. That's where we mixed it. Did you? Yeah. No. You, uh, Matthew's, Matthew's over. Uh, for, I was thinking, wait a minute. Uh, Matthew's uh, over. Because I was in there mixing something. Matthew's, uh, <laughs> Matthew's with Formosa Group and has done, besides feature film work, has done some stellar uh, streaming service television. What? It's hard to call something television today. We've got Tim Hoganacher, who's also in Formosa and now Signature Post. We have Tony Lamberti, who you'll hear his tracks back tonight on The Woman King, who was mixed in the Cary Grant right there. And we have Greg King of King Soundworks. Uh, they're sponsoring our cocktail party, so let's have a hand for Greg. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, he's the important guy here. Yeah. And, Be nice, laugh a lot. And, and Greg, Greg has mixed in a lot of variety on the King Soundworks and such. And we have the Orville uh, on display later. Uh, not necessarily your job, I understand. Was that Our crew, though. Their crew. Yeah. And so what we want to start off is sort of, let's start on the end with Matt and uh I want to say, Matt, what your first sort of experience mixing immersive, and and then your most recent. I mean, just bookend it for us. What what you can recall? Well, I'll be quick about it. I mean, you know, just like uh, Randy Tom said, it, it, for me, it was more about the env- uh, environments as much. I mean, we've been panning stuff even back in two track days. Yeah. You know, we're we love panning; it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that, but it was the full range of the uh, surrounds that was a big deal to me. Even playing a seven one mix in Atmos just from the beds made it sound even better. 
But uh, for me, then once I got past that, it was just the uh, um, the normal stuff. For me, one of my favorite things that I ever did in Atmos was we were in a cave and we had three characters. One had a, uh, a cane, another one had a lantern, and the other one didn't have anything. And but they came one at a time, and then and I put it in the objects, and I was able to pan them from the right surround to the front. And you could hear the person with the lantern was first, the cane second, and then no, that, and it was per, and I was just like, I remember we'd play this back. I'd be like, that is so cool. It was just so specific and so there. And then when it folded down to the five one, I was amazed at how it kept that imagery somehow. Dolby, kudos. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to me, that was really, uh, that really opened my eyes. And now when I'm mixing and doing anything, they're just tra beds, objects, they're tracks. I just, oh, let me put this in the object. Oh, nice, nice. It's not, it's not all of a sudden the plane by goes by. Okay, let me put that in the object. Well, you don't. You I'm don't. always thinking of it. Yeah, you think, you don't thinking about it less, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's, just, it's just part of the, you know, I remember when we went, uh, I'm old enough to know, and we were mixing in two track, and then we went to 5-1, and everybody goes, oh, my gosh, we're going to, how are we going to need seven more mixed days? We're going to need this. We're, <laughs> and no, no, we just all get used to it, and we just pan. It's just another speaker. Yep. And to me, that is really the beauty of Atmos, is it's become this natural thing, whether I'm in broadcast or whether I'm mixing a feature. We're just mixing an Atmos. This is uh, the way it goes. And it's, things are just, things are being moved around the world in Atmos, too. Yeah, I mean, whether yeah. it's going up to the services it's all mm -hmm. delivered at Atmos. They're passing around Atmos solely. Uh, but the one thing I'd like to say, just in case I don't give, get another chance, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I think, especially in the feature world, we need to deliver the 7-1 and the 5-1 for QC, do all their notes, and then do the, then do the Atmos. So just bitch. just print master the atmos because we have to wrap it and stuff like that and every time it comes back we got to bring dolby down we got to undo it we got to yeah. punch it we got to do this i'm like god we should just do this with the seven one ta -ta 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 -ta, so and then one pass depending on schedules yeah <laughs> True. are you mixing yeah. atmos from the get i mean you're mixing atmos from the get -go. definitely that, I mean, that yeah. learned that a long time yeah, ago yeah, yeah, natively yeah. for sure yeah, pretty much natively all, all hybrid all, all the time yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. once yeah, you see that gets odd yeah, yeah. So explain. explain to the audience if you would well, what we end up having to do is we'll do, if we deliver everything at the same time, QC will deliver everything at the same time, and they may find a problem with just one of the elements. Mm -hmm. And if they do it prior to us making the, or after having make it, make, made the Atmos file, we have to go back in and fix everything. That's common. And, and, then, it, and then it becomes common. a, a, a all hamster deliverables wheel. all the way down. Yeah, yeah. And then it becomes a hamster wheel where it gets re-QC'd again, and then maybe they didn't find something in the 7-1 before, and now they do. And we end up in this loop of of yeah. QC of going back in and having to touch everything up and mm -hmm. doing, you know retouching all the versions. And so that is that unique to the streaming world, or is that a feature film world as well? Feature all film. feature mm -hmm. feature Fe film, film world, yeah. feature film world more so because okay. in the in the streaming world you do the home theater Atmos and it's it's less problematic. Let's yeah. just say. Well, you're intensive. not under a tight schedule like you are with a feature where you have to bring yeah. Dolby down to do the print master. At least with the near field, you had you can export your ADM. Yeah. And oh, now I got to do a fix. Well, now just re-export the ADM now. It's like so a lot of here. so a lot of the changes are just mechanical. I mean, in a certain Some sense, the, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't I mean that. But your creative decisions have been made. It's like, how do I get that out there now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Let's let's break it and just to bring it back home. Uh, lots of things have been learned since the first year, right? And we're to get to rooms, studios themselves, and everything in a minute. But let's start with the center channel, if we could. All right. Um, in music, they're a little bit scared of the center channel right now. They don't know it means uh, thinking about headphones and faces up. They're not sure what they're doing with it. it it's being played out quite a bit. Um, the first thing I remember hearing Andy Nelson at their second event here talking about. Using music around the size to clear up a spot for the center. Uh, Tony, yeah. yep. you have a you have the woman keg this year. You yep. probably had a six years ago. You were doing some film. What have you learned about the center channel over the years? Well, the the important thing about the center channel, the, the great thing about Atmos and and immersive mixing in general is just how you can just clear everything out and the amount that that room opens up when you're in that mode. Um, like Matt was saying, you know, back in the days of five, you know, five channel, two channel, 
you know, it was always you, you, things could get jammed up and you would have to make mixed decisions based on the fact that you were getting jammed up. But with immersive and Atmos specifically, you, you have much wider soundstage that you can deal with. So you can really clear stuff out of the way. And like Tom was saying, you know, wrap things, or Andy was, wrap things around the room, move things into the height channels, whatever, to get it off the dialogue. Um, and then you can do things with dialogue that you could just never do in the old days and get away with it, which is, you know, pan it around the room seamlessly and, and have it, uh, you know, not change tonality as you're moving it around. Now, you have to take certain things into account, whether or not you're tied to a lot of production noise, those kind of things, because if you start doing that and you have a lot of noise in your track, you can, it gets very distracting very quickly. But, uh, but if it's clean, and it, or if it's ADR, or whatever, and it's helping tell the story, too. If it's something that really makes sense story-wise, by all means, just, I say, go for it. The format's made a, for it. You know? do, you add a bit of, do you add a bit of dialogue into the left and right, besides? Uh, you, you know, certain things, like if you're doing some narration that you want to set apart uh -huh. to the main part of the dialogue, like in Woman King, if you go see that movie, the opening narration is LCR. So it's it's to give it a more of a presence because it's like kicking off the movie and it's it's basically setting you up for what you're about to see. And so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll spread it differently and, you know, to yeah. try to set it apart. Tim, you know, what, you know uh, I was going to say one thing about uh, about that with pulling dialogue off the screen. Uh, there was a show we worked on years ago where theatrically you pulled it off the screen. It sounded really cool pulling it off, and it just fit in just really nicely. When we went down to a home Atmos environment with the spatial coding going on, you would actually hear it kind of pulsing between the screen and the sides, oh, and it go it go thump thump thump. And it was one of those things where I had to like pull it just a few percentage back or forward just one way or the other uh, so see, that I it would just stop I doing afraid, that and yeah. stop making this crazy noise. Yeah. And so those, those are the things that we kind of learn over the years and go, oh, okay, and don't curious, do that again. Did, were you in the bed at that point or in objects? When uh, the, that was objects. Was doing that? Oh, yeah, was that? that was an object okay. thing. Yeah, and then that's the other thing. Obviously going to, to from a theatrical where you got these nice side, you know, you can put objects on the sides. Home, your side surrounds, there's a gap between here and that side over yeah. there. And now once you start pulling up the screen, you're going from here, bam, over to there. And so if you pull things off the screen a little bit, it's going to, you know, it might feel a little faux, uh, <laughs> for lack mean, of a better term. Yeah. But, yeah. And center channel, Greg. I mean, what do, you, uh, yeah. do you go, do you load it up or do you clear it out? For me, my whole mix starts <laughs> at the center channel. Yeah. That's where it starts. That's the foundation. That's the anchor. And that's where all the dialogue is. And that's our main focus. That's where our brain processes it really well. And then I build the rest of the mix around that dialogue. And I will do, like we, the other guys were just talking about, there's times where you can change that with narration, things like that. We've done quite a few space things where it's really nice if you're in a space capsule or something yeah. like that, to float it around. And especially in Atmos, because you have the full bandwidth in the surrounds, it, it works seamlessly. So, and when you use it in those instances, it tends to really make its point. Um, because of all the reasons we've talked about, even in 5.1, if you, if you move the dialogue too much away from the center, it can tend to pull the audience away from the story a little bit. It's, it's tough. So, so you can't have dialogue walk across the screen or anything. Really. No, but, <laughs> but animation is one. Animation is a format where you can get away with a lot of dialogue moving around because yeah. yeah. you're not attached to a lot of organic real things yeah. Yeah. animations yeah. like the original object mixing yeah. you could take any sound any piece of dialogue and put it anywhere in the room right. when you get to live action you can't really do that you can't take the dialogue and move it here because now all the traffic and the, everything else has to go it just and it messes with the way we listen to human beings speak yeah. you know even when you're speaking to me now i'm kind of hearing you in the center of my brain because what you're saying is primarily taking up the mo most bandwidth in my brain. So when you start to move dialogue around too much, I think it, it, you, it makes you feel off kilter. And, you're not and it's one of the most distracting things. You don't ever want to pull the audience out, right? I mean, yeah. That could be very distracting. Exactly. In yeah. a sense. Um, uh, hi. <laughs> uh, well, uh, then we'll get to a full range surround uh, kind of thing. But high channels, I mean, never had that opportunity really before. Um, so could you give me any, like how you dealt with space bef both before and what Atmos has brought? I mean, is this is, is height primarily for your backgrounds, for your environments that we talk about? Or Tony, not, let's start not, with you. Not, not necessarily. What are the heights no. for? The, they can be for anything. I mean, okay. if they're helping tell the story, you okay. know, uh, primarily, you know, I will use them for backgrounds primarily. Okay. But other things like if it's a piece of design where I have, a, I normally like to have my bed stems as a as a nine one bed, so that I can quickly get things to the heights that aren't I don't necessarily want to throw into an object. And I use I use nine one reverbs, 
so that if I put something in a reverb, if it's a piece of design, say, some cool, whooshy thing, and I'll have it just so that the reverb bleeds into the tops a bit, just so it helps fill the like space. A kiss of it? Yeah, just a little kiss of it here and there. And I'll do that with a bunch of different things. I don't leave that just for backgrounds. It depends on exactly what I'm trying to do, and it's helping tell the story. Then then I'll bleed things into the tops. Obviously, it's, it's great for object, you know, pure object things to fly through there, but I use the tops for, for a lot of different things other than just backgrounds. Matt, what do you... What, what? Well, uh, speaking about the 10 year anniversary and, and my knowledge of uh, Atmos and mixing in Atmos, I was just laughing about the heights because when I first mixed Atmos and I was doing a ship scene and I put all the waves on the top because I thought it was cool. And then I played it back and I'm like, why are there waves on the yeah. top? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. Yeah. But needless yeah. to say, I fixed it before, before yeah. it came out. But yeah. uh, so anyway, so you just experiment and try things and then see if it see if it's cool, cool or not. But then yeah. what I like to do is I like to do layers, especially in rains and stuff like that. You know, there's just different levels. And that's where you really, man, when you get a sound designer that works with you and you can get drops of rain and, and then a bed of rain and then this, man, you can just place it. All, I mean, just the 360 immersion yeah. of that is just wonderful. And then getting back to reverbs, it's super fun to put a nice slap delay and and that and I'll just put that in the heights and then I'll put some on the bottom and there'll be two different ones. And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, your, your world's an oyster. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, yeah. it's so fun. Yeah. Greg, did you want to chime in a bit there? More to the yeah, no, I, I think the, the ceiling stuff is, that's the fun place. That's like the experimentation. Let's try this and see if it sticks. You know, whether it's with reverbs or you have obvious things like thunder you could stick up there. Or if you're in an airport, you could put the, a bit of the PA up there. And it, But it's fun to mess with reverbs and backgrounds and sound effects and yeah. see what it does. And, and we talked about this a little bit in the green room. I also find the decisions I make about ceiling height and atmos differs whether I'm mixing a feature or I'm mixing for streaming or, or television. I find it, it, it sort of informs like the decision I'm going to make, the mix decision I'm going to make, depending on where the final product's going to be viewed. Absolutely. So you, yeah. you absolutely have to take that into account. I mean, yeah, I mean. Hmm. Well, because at home, you have more of a static place. That you have to fill yeah. rather than very pinpointed areas. And it, it, exactly. it makes you think of it differently because you now, you're, now you're in large clusters that yeah. you're filling in a home environment. Yeah, you so, know the other yeah. thing I think of is like the, the other way I look at it too is like when we're mixing a feature, we're in a room that's then going to a very predefined control space, being a movie theater. And we have two movie theaters. We have a, a shoebox yeah. and we have a stadium, right? <laughs> so we're pretty certain that what we're doing in the dub stage is going to translate more or less into that, into that format. When we get into home atmos, now you're in the wild, wild west because there's virtually no standard for what people are listening to at home, whether it be the speaker system they use, or the size and shape of the room, the height of their ceiling, the, the variables are, are endless, right? But all that being said, is that the home viewer, anybody who's got Atmos, just dropped a few grand in an Atmos system. And every now and then it's fun to have them go, wow, did that just come out of the ceiling? Yeah. So I'm all, at the end of the day, we're doing entertainment. Yeah. So I also want to think about for the home person, and they've gone and bought this Atmos, like maybe I'll make a decision I won't make in a feature. I'll just go, F it, I'm going to throw yeah. that up there. Yeah. I'm going to do this wild pan because there's someone at home going to go, holy shit, this yeah. was worth the yeah. three grand. Yeah. So yeah. that's why, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, we, we talk know. about that, and especially that came up in music, right? Because mm -hmm. in the music industry, we tend to like argue about, damn it, they're not hearing 24 bit in the, in the <laughs> bit stream and all this. And you go like, they want the experience. If you could get Taylor Swift right now and make that different and forget about... Uh, you know, sample rates and things like that for a minute. If the 15 year old kid has a different experience and it's pleasant, mm -hmm. we've got acceptance. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that right? Yeah, you don't, yeah, you, you, wanna, bring you wanna back. lose the technical part of it. You wanna have yeah. the, the content be something that engages the listener, that has them, you know, whatever it is, music or movies or TV or whatever, streaming, whatever it is, to be, to, to embrace the content and not the technical part of yeah. it. All right, let's keep going around the room in terms of the speaker. So, I mean, when you get full range of the, of the sides, I mean, how, how did that change? Because there was certainly a, a, a big deal, a big difference in certainly the way that Atmos translates up and down, I would say up and down the chain yeah. from that okay. mid-sized room, you know, that we talk about the 714 yeah. room. Well, um, how has your impression of the side speakers changed 
in, in the last well, 10 years. You, well, you have to have full range. Yeah. It's just, you just have to have it because when you're pulling stuff around the room, it, it has to, it can't change tonality from the f screen channels to the back channels. It just cannot do that because that will just pull you out so quick. I'll tell you a quick little story. So, um, before Dolby Atmos, I happened to be working at a company um, called Tadeo, and we were demoing. We were our engineering staff was helping a company called from Germany called Eosono, and Eosono had a system where they had four by four, um, four feet by four feet panels of four inch drivers, and they wrapped the whole room in these in this thing, and that and then they had a computer that was object based. So we take a Pro Tool session, play tracks into it. And, um, and, you know, basically do object-based mixing. Well, they didn't have a recorder figured out. They didn't have a way to make stems figured out. They didn't have a way to make deliveries figured out. Um, when, when we told them that, like, well, the dialogue doesn't sound like dialogue because you have these little four-inch drivers, they, they said, okay, great. Well, we'll use the screen channels and we'll use the subwoofer from the main part of the room. And then we'll have the rest of the surround be the Eosono system. And... As soon as you came off the screen, it was super cool because you could do, you know, you could do what Matt was talking about. You could take rain and you could have drops dropping around. But the tonal quality between the screen channels and what you were hearing out Mids of the room in high city. was just like, it was just, it wasn't <laughs> theatrical. Jarring. Jarring. Yeah, it was to completely take you out of it. So, so long story short, um, you know, the, that company isn't around anymore. They're not doing it because Dolby figured out correctly that it has to be the same coming from the screen into the room and 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 then all the other things that are that are you know go along with that making being able to make stems and being able to to have deliveries and and all that kind of stuff so it was um you know that you know the original point was that you know yeah. it, it's it's you have to have these kind of speakers full range from Front to back. It was five, five one. Had a lot of satellites. So it was those speakers, yeah. right? I mean that type yeah, thing. Small little, yeah. small little Tim, satellites. Tim, what, I mean, what is your? Uh, do you have? Do you love the sides now? I mean, they're... oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, it's a lot. It's really changed over as far as obviously. I mean, now we have to think about like sound bars and things like that yeah. too. You know, and think about how that's going to disperse into yeah. into a home environment. But top, top firing but, sound bars yeah. and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But. But that's the thing, going from the side, going from a theatrical size, we got all this low end and all this robust low end going on. And then going now and making a home atmos or a home down mix from that 5.1 is actually sometimes pretty challenging depending on the material. Because like, like now all that low end is going to be flipped now going towards the sub yeah. and the front. And is it going to take, is it changing the perspective of what you intended? You, you know? do need two subs. Um, yeah. Let's so. uh, <laughs> put one uh, behind you. Okay, okay, uh, <laughs> You live in a, a lot of television or streaming, and mm -hmm. you live with a foot in the feature world. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you play with those sides? Oh, to me, it's like going from 3D to 2D to 3D. It's like it's totally opened up and changed the way we mix, yeah. uh, both in theatrical and in, in television. Just having it full range now, now you can pretty much put anything you want back there. So you can be more creative with your music placement. You get music stems where you want to place the orchestra around the surrounds, you can make different decisions than you did when we had the big roll off, certainly with sound effects as well. And, um, and even dialogue on those occasions now where you, if you do want to do something fun with the dialogue, you can do so with confidence where before it'd be like, Ooh, boy, this is putting have... dialogue in the surrounds. Was, you was you could, but you could also just go part way up the wall, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. You don't have to, yeah. you don't have to go yeah. bam, right? Mm -hmm. uh, bat. you, uh, you know, you've lived in the, uh, I mean, Game of Thrones is a calling card. I'm sure you're, like, that's not the only thing I've done, Tom. Uh, <laughs> it is. It was, a, it was a great gig. I miss it. Nice gig. Anyone? Uh, yeah. uh, so what did you, I mean, because you have that theatrical sense. It's, can I ask, what size room were you when you were mixing that? I mean, how big, where were you? We started at Todd A.O. in one of the smallest rooms I've ever mixed in. Really? Yeah, over at, not, uh, over at Seward, over at the Glen Glen building. We were in stage six. Which oh, wow. was hilarious. Um, <laughs> imagine, funny, imagine funny now, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> imagine a room ten feet by ten feet. <laughs> exactly. And uh, it was twelve by twelve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had it. And we had eight feet of the You're ceiling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you know, I mean, I just uh, I got back from uh, just got done uh, mixing in New York at uh, Harbor Grand, and they have a really great room there. And it's it's nothing like the rooms out in L.A. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that is great is it's high ceilings. Yeah. And that's what I find on, on any small room even stage six had high ceilings yeah. and if you can move the hair with the high ceilings 
you're going to be okay. It, it is really it's Greg, super. Greg, what are your stages like? I mean, over at King Sidewalks. I mean, there's there's smaller stages. They're like um, on average like 35 long by about 20 feet wide, and they're both for five one and Atmos. And um, not just because I have stages that size, but I've always loved, especially working on features like pre dubbing on a small stage. Like I'd pre dub whether it be like Hancock, which we mix on the Cary Grant or what have you. I would do all my pre mixing in a small room. And then go up, whether it be dialogue or effects, and then go up to the bigger room for the final. I've always just really liked the way it translated. And if you can make something really powerful and impactful and make all that ADR and dialogue sing in a small room, it's going to sound fantastic in a, in a big room. Yeah. What's, what's, yeah. What do they say? What you push the air? Because I will mm -hmm. say that the first year the first year or two, and I probably heard this in the previous panel, but it was the Holden Theater. That was it here, right? In our first year of the Mix South for Film event. Um, in, uh, in rooms around town, it was sort of a theatrical medium at that point. And everybody sort of presumed we're going to the big rooms. But then they came down to these, uh, what we have in the later panel called that, what did I call it, the mid, versatile, mid-sized, multi-purpose mix room. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's hard to try that three times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's and that good. is, I mean, is it, and I think part of that is because of the translation of Atmos up and down. I mean, on the one hand, obviously you have to do things for the home environment and the close field and everything that are different. But... What's your sense of the room itself right now? Everybody loves to go into the grant. Very few people get to, correct? So, Tim, you want to start us off? I mean, the yeah, size I mean, of the, the room. The size of the room, it's, it's interesting. Like, we were talking about this in the green room earlier, about, about, you know, with Atmos, it's, I, I think of it as like a scaling balloon. Yeah. Like it's a, you're in a large room like the, like the grant, yeah. you know, and you scale it down to something this size. And it's, it's just imagine of a balloon that you're just, every, all the pinpoints of everything is falling into place. You know, to all the way down to hopefully all the way down to your iPad, yeah. you know, so it's it's that part is, you know, obviously with a large room, you got to move more air as yeah. we talked about, too. Yeah. You got to move a lot more, get more, but, more movement going. So then obviously yeah. when you get in a smaller room now, it's like, OK, now it's too much. Uh, yeah. uh, Tony, do you do you ever check detail in a smaller room as you're going along? I mean, how do you how does that work? Occasionally, occasionally. Unfortunately, um, or fortunately for me, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a little spoiled because I get to primarily pre-mix in this room and mix in the grant. Yeah. So mm. over the last couple, two or three years. So, yeah. But um, one of the things we do do is we do a whole um, home theater mastering pass um, at the end of our project. So when we're all said and done, we go into a room that uh, we've set up that's run by Mr. Brian Vessa. And uh, we sit with, I sit Woo! with, I sit with Brian, Brian uh, uh, and whoever it is, <laughs> whether it's myself or whoever I mixed with, depending on schedules and all that kind of stuff, we go into that room and we, we listen to it in that environment and, and tweak it and, and really make it sing for that environment. And I think that that's, that mm -hmm. takes our, what we deliver out there in, in home video world, um, you know, it really, we put a lot of love and care into that. So, yeah. and I, I do some of these um, near field mixes I've done with Brian as well, where we mix in a theatrical at most. And then Brian and I would bring him into a smaller room at the time I was doing some over at Formosa. And, and that's the thing is we're always trying to respect yeah. the, the intention of the mix, knowing that, okay, everything's going to kind of hit you harder here. Yeah. And so it was always very yeah. respectful of keeping that yeah. relationship. What, I mean, yeah. what is the small room detail, the big room power? I mean, is it that simple? What do we, what do we have? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, power on the big room for sure, you know, <laughs> but, but everything stands out more in a small room, obviously, yeah. the yeah. little high end, every little tick you're going to hear, a little digital yeah. tick, yeah. they're going to hit you in the ear in a yeah. small you room. They get a lot they're more, get, they get a lot lost more in a room in like this. Room. Yeah. And that's why on QCs, you come back on QCs, oh, well, there's a little tick in the little yeah. thing. It's like, well, yeah, it's because we're listening in a, no, there's not. In a <laughs> giant cavern, <laughs> listen in here, you don't hear it, yeah. but you get it in, in a little tiny room. It's like, oh yeah, it's clearly there, you yeah. know, and so. Matt, yeah. Same experience, Matt. You, you, that you go up and down now, are you big rooms, medium rooms? I'm just a big room guy. That's, yeah. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you pay my rate, I'll go in the closet. It doesn't matter. But anyway, uh, no. um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm mixing all over town, all different size stages. Um, Tony kicks me out of stages all the time. I, oh, yeah, okay, I'll go to the next one. Uh, but no, it's, um, you know, what I just care about when I go to different rooms, there's some small rooms in town that I love, but what I really care about is the EQ of the room more than anything? Uh, mm -hmm. Like I can go. I'm sure all these guys will test, and anybody out there will test. You go to a room and you you hear stuff, and you start to do these weird EQs, and you're like, "What? I've been doing this for a long time. I never have to EQ." And have then all of a sudden, I'm like, "Get the engineer. Let's pink. Let's do this. Something's up. Something's amiss." Yeah, right. You can tell. So, you can tell almost by the moves you're making. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. Pretty yeah. Like well, it, especially if you're doing a lot of the same move over mm -hmm. and over. I keep having to push it yeah. 400 or something. 
And so it's just yeah. the sound. The sound of the room is really what's key to me. Where I have confidence in what I'm doing. And I think I think the yeah, pandemic also pushed a lot of the a lot of the rooms to be small rooms. A lot, a lot of pe a lot of people couldn't come into environments like this. They had to go work in smaller rooms. So there's a uh, there's been a whole learning curve in terms of you know getting everybody used to. Okay, how did things translating? Are we, now I'm working in a small room. I, I on certain films that I do here, I work. I do some sound design on, uh, where I'm involved in the sound design side of it, and so I know when I'm working in my sound design rig or my setup, how it's going to translate when I go to the Cary Grant. Yeah. So, so we, cool. we've learned to scale our, our brains and our creative thinking around that as much as and the technology it, has. And in the 10 years, are you more comfortable with knowing how that works? Uh, oh, I, mean, absolutely. I mean, the first was discovery, correct? Yeah. 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 A, a bit, but you know, it was just, it's just, uh, just experience, just, yeah. you know, doing it over and over and over. Greg, same thing. Greg, uh, Big, oh, up and down. Yeah, no, I'm. I think I think Matt hit it on the head. It's like it's what the room sounds like, um, and and especially now, it's like we're getting we're doing theatrical movies where the theatrical release is the afterthought. Like we're we're doing <laughs> movies for Netflix and Amazon and all the streaming services where it's a theatrical release, but the 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 realistic goal is it's going to be in the theater for two weeks yeah. to qualify for awards, and that's going to live the rest of its existence. And so it's not like. Yeah we're mixing for these big movie palaces and stuff anymore like we used to. It's like, you know, it's multiplexes and also, um, you know, it's just in the theater for a limited amount of time. How it's going to live on Apple or how it's going to live on yeah, Netflix. Exactly how it's gonna, yeah, exactly. exactly how it's going to live for, for eternity, eternity as opposed to those first few weeks. And so movies are being designed like that where it's like, okay, let's do the streaming. Oh, and we also have to do a full theatrical deliverable as yeah. opposed to the other way around. And also, since I mix around all, all the time and go to different stages, I have a drive with me of, uh, of uh, stuff that I've mixed that I trust that I've heard wow. in lots of places. And I'll, if I'm going into a room that I've never been in before, that's the first thing I'll do. I'll put up, say, hey, let's put up this scene. I want to hear how it sounds in yeah. here. And then that way I know. In the music world, it's usually Steely Dan they put up. Yeah, Asian. Yeah. 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 Smart, smart people. Yeah. 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 That's it. Uh, <laughs> since we've done all the speakers, I mean, one of the bugaboos, uh, it, it doesn't take Atmos to make low end a challenge. Um, it's been a challenge all, I mean, throughout music production and everything else, build up of low end. So I'd love to talk about sort of the subwoofer. Uh, what your considerations that you bring into your, you know, once you get below 80 or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, base management, these types of things. What have you learned about low end in the last 10 years and how this works? Tim, can we start with you? Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that I, is one thing that I've definitely learned is that I'm not just putting some things in the low end only in the LFE. Um, in fact, part of my templates actually is I have, I'll be sending things to the LFE, but also sending a lot of some of that equal low end to left, center, right, yeah. knowing that how it's going to down mix. And because for a while there, I don't, it's not so much anymore, but for a while there, for example, back in the DVD player days, <laughs> sometimes these DVD discs, it would actually chop off the LFE on a down mix. It would just chop it off so you'd be gone. So now it's like, now I, I really look at it like, well, I'm not just filling the LFE. You know, I want to fill the other channels left, center, right as well, just to give it some girth, you know, in yeah. case. Because also, that's the thing is a moving target is you don't know how people's subs are set up at home and yeah. Yeah, yeah. who knows. And, you know, in theaters even, it's all a moving target. So I try to fill at least kind of those four points. Sure. If you have some yeah. in the LCR, you know, you're going to have some of them. Yeah. At least some of it's there. Yeah. It's not completely There's lost. So, uh, yeah. Tony, uh, expand. You got, I mean, you obviously work at a big theatrical primarily. Right. Well, uh, and, but. It's changed over time, but you know, it's uh, like Tim was saying, you know, you want to, because the main sounds so great down to a low frequency, um, and you want to make sure that some of that stuff is, is in there. If you just rely solely on the sub, you know, you're going to, you end up, you end up regretting it. And, and I have done mixes in the past where I've just had all this stuff in the sub and, you know, and then gone and seen and field and the, and the sub wasn't set up correctly or something was, you know, something happened in the, in the, um, technically with, with the transfer or how it was playing back and it was just like, oh my God, where did it all go? You know what I mean? And so you want to make sure that you, that if you're playing with your low end and you really want to have things kick, you know, having it, having some in the left, right, at least yeah. is, is, uh, is definitely beneficial. Matthew, Matthew, uh, how much do you love low end? 
Who doesn't love Lily? <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Uh, but what's uh, funny is uh, uh, I generally will, uh, on a big action sequence or anything like that, for me, I just because I came from the optical world and all that other stuff and not uh, relying on the sub, I'll actually turn the sub off and I'll mix it and I'll try and make it work. Uh, with oh. the low end and stuff like that and i go okay this is really balls that's awesome okay cool now let me just go because i can fake myself out even because you're going so fast you're doing so boom, boom boom okay awesome it sounds great and like everyone said you take the subwoofer out and it's like yeah. but uh so that's what i that's what i do is started play without the sub yeah if i'm getting into a big action sequence i'll just mute the sub and then i'll put the sub back in and then have fun Greg, Greg, how, how do you like that? Uh, very similar, because I learned the hard way when I came down here in 94. The first mix, uh, mix I did was with uh, Richard Portman. And, um, Not a bad place to start. So, so old school <laughs> yeah. mixer, and, and he's like, what the hell are you putting all that subwoofer in there? When we make the two track, you're not going to hear any of that damn stuff. What are you doing? So I was like, he goes, here's what you do. And then he taught me how to use like even a subharmonic synthesizer and EQ and spread it over the mains and get as much of that low end out of the mains, oh, okay. and then use the subwoofer for the punches, you know, for the for those moments. And and, right. and then when you did downscale and you went down to the two track, which at that time in 94, still 80% of the theaters were still two track, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it lived and you didn't you didn't hear a different mix. So with uh, so for the Velociraptors, you don't really, you can do it in the mains, but with the T-Rex mm -hmm. Cubs. Then you gotta go. <laughs> better, <okay>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> We're gonna open it up now. We got about ten minutes. We have a. I hope you have questions. We have a. We have a stellar uh, panel up here. So, raise your hand. Think about it. Anybody? 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 Thank you. Hey, uh, I always. I know how Greg thinks about this because we work together a lot. But I'm curious how uh, you guys think of objects versus beds. I know there are some disagreements out there. Some people don't like to use objects at all. Some people like to use as many as they can get. So well, we were talking about guys. that in the green room earlier. And I think one of the great things about the way that Atmos was designed was that it allows the user to use it in whatever fashion they're most comfortable with. Some people love doing stuff only in objects. Skip Lee say did Roma all in objects. Mm -hmm. Um, some people love only beds. You know, some people like uh, they they just cling to that traditional. I want to know it's in a stem. I want to know it's that. Some people use a, a combination thereof. I use a combination thereof. Some things I'll leave in the bed. Other things I'll I'll make sure I have in objects. And and it's just case by case. It's it's are you you know is that whatever is helping tell the story. So um, so you know it's I like using a combination personally. Say across the board. Well, I'd say, yeah, I mean, I'm a combo guy, but the one thing that uh, I'm sure everybody does now, so this is kind of an idiot statement, but I make sure all my EQs, reverb sends, and all that are the same on the object tracks as I do as my bed tracks. And that way, if I'm mixing and and, and I, all of a sudden, you know, I do something really cool and I'm like, oh, maybe I want that in the object tracks. I can just pop it down. It's no big deal. It takes a second. Boom. And it sounds great. And then I can even have more access of it. So that's one thing over the years, over the 10 years that I've started to make sure it just mirrors all the time. And it's just a different output. You know, I've, I've definitely done the extreme of both. I've had some where it was entirely all objects being printed with just this bed that's just LFE, basically, with that empty channels. <laughs> so it's kind of ridiculous. But <laughs> that, that never but, gets, never gives, it, yeah. that gives a QC note. Yeah, it keeps, it's only low end in there. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Yeah, because I did everything else everywhere else. But, but the, and then I've done other mixes where it was pretty much all beds before. I've, I've, I feel good that I've done both. But like I did a musical just not too long ago, a theatrical musical, where it was, I definitely put, I use a lot of beds, but then I put the orchestra and then the background vocals on on objects very pinpointed very specifically Where does the choir go yeah well i mean Where? all around i mean it's really it's just but very pinpointed because it was just it just lush yeah. you know it emotionally pulls you in that way you know yeah. i will say one, one other thing is and it, more and as tony was saying the way dolby's done this is just such a creative world now there is no stopping there's like yeah. if, if, if somebody wants to put it all i mean your world's your oyster. There's no right answer when it comes to this. You know, you just sit there and you go, oh, that sounds great. That helps the story out great. Oh, that's so emotional. Oh, my gosh. And the director loves it. So it's like we were saying earlier. Oh, yeah. It's like, about, you know, we can all do it differently yeah. and getting the same mm -hmm. result. Yeah. If we had the same tracks in front of all four of us, <laughs> yeah. it, we would approach it probably four different, completely different ways. So 
I, and I, I'm the director in that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another one up there. Thank you, gentlemen. I really like that description of the expanding and collapsing balloon, which oh, kind of cool. helps with the question that I have. Mm -hmm. So I understand, you know, like in the theater, you get up to 64 speakers, and in the home, you can do 32. So the balloon depends on the size of the room, the number of the speakers. So what I'm having a hard time understanding is like with some of the Disney titles when they hard code to 714. How does that really play back in a system that has many more speakers? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I think it's based off of, and I could be wrong in this, but I think it's based off of the, um, the spatial coding yeah. in the mix itself. So it's yeah. going it's gonna, it's, to, if you have more speakers than what, than what it was intended, it's going to just phantom between those different speakers. And if you have wides, for example, which I don't know anybody at home that really has wides, but some people do, and then it's going to fill those areas, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's this, not this, a perfect. The, this, you know. the spatial metadata is still there, and the objects are still doing what they're doing, but it's coming out of four speakers. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to read yeah. what those where those yeah, speakers and it's are supposed positioned. to scale yeah. to that. It's, it's, the positional data stays the same. It's just, it's, exactly. it's putting it out of force. Yeah, if I pan have. something right there, and yeah, again, on the balloon statement, you know, it's the same kind of idea. It, the theory is that it's still going to come out from that direction, no matter how your speakers are set up. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but that's the idea is it keeps it in relation, and that's kind of comes back to the clustering on that. It's so. better to do the full half Over here, Michael. Bring it down. We got to do the whole... If Chris Jacobson would yeah. like to ask you a question now. Yeah. Now you're trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, Chris uh, emailed me about a month ago, thrilled, to, uh, excited that it was coming back. So come on. Oh, Chris. Hey, you guys. Hi, Chris. Um, what's been your experience with either translation or mixing natively in the other various formats that are out there? DTSX, uh, what is it, IMAX 12.0, or Aura 3D? I mean, most of those are probably almost irrelevant, irrelevant at this point, but uh, have you had any experience with those? Yeah, I mean, I've done some versioning where it end, you end up doing those passes of the IMAX 12 or, or the um, Oro. Um, for, for my money, they just don't sound as good. Uh, you know, the IMAX 5 sounds great. Um, the and, and Atmos for me is the format. So, um, you know, I know that those, the, other, the other things, you know, the IMAX 12.0, you know, it, you know, they may or may not, certain places may or may not play that. But in, in terms of Oro, I can't, you know, I haven't seen an Oro guy for years. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know, you know, if there even still exists. They're, they're, doing, they're, a lot, they're doing a lot with music on the codec level in, in Europe right now, from my, my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, any more questions? Oh, wait. Oh, he, now Michael has to run. We're going to get Michael Coleman to work out here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Michael Coleman there does um, Soundworks collection. By the way, if you've all Michael. seen those videos and everything, Michael does a great and, job. Uh, all during all during the pandemic, from mixes videos to the things we did through award season, that's a uh, that's yeah. Michael right there. Yeah. So we, he does an amazing job. Yes, he does. And so we have, we have time for one more question. Here we go. So uh, my partner just delivered his first Atmos mix to Netflix, and the first thing that we noticed was that compared to other programs that are similar, it was playing back low, even though he was mixing at the higher end of the loudness spec. So I'm wondering if anybody can comment on what's apparently a, a loudness war going on with the streaming services? Oh, I can. Uh, John, John Greasley and I have written numerous articles about loudness and broadcast standards and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's, I mean, you're sort of following the grill in the room, and the grill in the room is Netflix, right? And they set the standard of negative 27 LKFS. Um, and they, they, they came up with that as because it's a nice middle ground. If you measure most features, they come in in the negative 28 to 32 range, 27. You know, broadcast is negative 24, give or take. So they found if you just do negative 27, it sort of sits there. So if he's mixing and if he's mixing to the spec, like if they're asking for a negative 27, it, it shouldn't be coming in low. But are we talking about overall throughout the whole process? Or are we talking about the loud moments are not loud enough? I mean, that's that's the other question. Mm. Is it? I mean, meaning, uh, is dialogue? it not dynamic enough? Well, the other thing too okay. is is whether measuring in dash three or dash one. So measuring full program or with dialogue is the anchor. Dialogue gated. So if you're yeah. doing dialogue gated, you're good. At, that, that's my preference. That's the one I like the most. That's where you get the best. 
the truest the reading. That's where you get the truest reading and you get the most dynamics in the mix. Otherwise, if you mix full program, a loud, super huge, loud action movie is actually going to be lower in level than a dialogue driven movie because that's it's measuring right. yeah it, it sucks really bad so and they and we know who this who the broadcasters are and all those people who want full programs so we won't mention them by name but that's the biggest <laughs> difference between those standards is that full program and measuring dialogue anchor will have a dramatic effect on the out on the final output level of the show if the show's not a dialogue driven show if it's an action show it's going to be radically different yeah, dialogue centric will be very very even between the two measuring formats. And well that... Well said. Well, well <laughs> hey, I think that was a plant. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. I can't thank these gentlemen enough. Greg, Tony, Tim, Matthew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for putting uh, it on.